How do you make songs so fast? I was born silly. We were watching the Wiggles, and I had a video of him pretending to be the blue wiggle. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Nothing is okay. None of it's good. Everything is bad. <laughs> Let it all be bad. Hello folks, welcome back to the Killer Hearts channel. George here, and today I'm interviewing Lee, AKA Must Die, who's just finished working on a content bank for us. Hello Lee, how are you? I'm good. I'm uh, a little tired, but it, not as bad as it could be. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, you said you were back playing shows for the first time in a long time. Yeah, as, as safely as I can. I was in, I'm in Portland right now. I'm in a hotel, uh, hotel room. But it, I mean, it was good. It was, uh, I don't feel like it was a big danger. So that was good. Fantastic. Is it a different experience than you remember? Is it something changed? It's kind of funny how similar to riding a bike it is. It's like exactly the same. But I did notice people were giving each other like quite a wide berth, which I thought was pretty cool. It, there was a lot of like uh, moshing without touching, <laughs> which I guess is pogoing. I don't know. It was really interesting. Absolutely. I suppose the energy is necessarily going to change a little bit and people are thinking about these things in such different ways that you can't avoid a certain... Uh, change of direction but for you it felt pretty natural yeah it felt uh, from from the booth it felt the same Fantastic. like there was no difference except for that i was wearing a mask which i have done in the past anyway for fashion reasons so it didn't Excellent. really feel different at all to me nice were you working with new material different material than before yeah um i put out an album during the last year and uh I basically took the album and like just based my entire set off like tangents that I went on, on during the album. So like on the record, there's like a fair bit of like hard style and trance and like hard house. And so I was like, okay, I'll just go off these, on these tangents, which like primarily I'm known for just making dubstep, which like has never actually been true, but it's like what people think of. So this time I really wanted to set apart like, no, this is like very multi-genre. It's a lot, and uh, I think it went well. We'll see. We'll we'll check the Twitter responses in a little bit when everyone wakes up. See how much that went down. It's kind of a leading question, but you led me into it, so I'll lead you back into it. Is dubstep a dirty word? To me, I think dubstep can be a dirty word when it's used by someone who doesn't like dubstep. <laughs> sure. um, I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of stigma with the genre um, simply because for a minute there and for a minute now, there's a lot of lowest common denominator music, but I find the same thing about a lot of other genres as well, that there's the barrier of entry is really low. So yeah, dubstep can be a dirty word, but if you do the work, it's actually a super rewarding genre. So I don't know. I, I get the criticism. Like I am, I have been, involved in it for so long like nearly a decade now of just like constant having to talk about dubstep that like i understand that it was a dirty word to me and now i don't think i don't think it is all the time i, I enjoy the genre and you talk about putting in the work what exactly is the work that you need to put into dubstep to define it as something uh, worthwhile yeah i think putting in the work what i meant by that is that I think on every genre, there's your surface level sound. And then you find out, oh, people actually don't really care about that one. Like that's the one that's in all the playlists. And like, it's just kind of, it just kind of exists. Like a lot of like house music is not just like top 40 radio house. It's just not. And you dig past that. And there's like this extremely rich ecosystem of like so many different styles and sounds that are fresh, new and exciting and like innovative. And that's the work. It's like pushing through and like doing your just like, I guess a good way of explaining it is when you hear something that is bare bones and basic, but you kind of like it, push further down the rabbit hole in that way and see what happens. Because chances are you're going to come across something that like is absolutely mind blowing to you, like in any genre, but dub dubstep, especially there's, like I said, low barrier of entry. There's a lot of really bad dubstep. And I want to delve into your history in the genre and in other genres um, in a moment. But 
I wanted to touch first on your particular process. When you're making music, is it like sounds first, music later, or the other way around, or some mixture? Uh, it's music first, sounds, depending on when I need them. Like, uh, typically, I don't uh, save my patches. Like, that. that's something that I never really did. I, I did it a little bit um, a couple of years ago. You know, I did a like a splice pack. And so I was saving patches and then I was using them and then just grabbing them later. But generally when I write music, I write a song um, and I sound design as I go to fit the song. That way nothing ever feels out of place or like atonal or without consideration. And I think it gels everything together a lot more. And how did you enjoy working with Faceplant in creating this new content bank it's so funny phase plan when it first came out i played with it for a while and liked it and was like oh yeah this is this is like really really cool you can do all of these different things like to the point where it's basically limitless and that put me off for a minute where i was like okay yeah like i'm gonna have to like sit down and do this and then i started making these patches and i was like it's really not like that at all. Like it's exactly the same workflow as like everything else I've always loved. It's like kind of what you make of it. And then, and then I, so I made a bunch of patches like in like your standard, like coming from serum or coming from massive or coming from, you know, uh, Dune or any of like your standard sense, uh, like your standard wave table, wave table sense or uh, FM stuff. And then I was like, Oh, I haven't messed with the wavetable editor. Like I'll mess with that because I've always wanted to like get into making wavetables. I just never had the time and I have a lot of time right now. So I sat down and like within 30 minutes, I'm making like insane wavetables. <laughs> and I was like, I keep expecting things to take a long time and they really don't. So the process was surprising. The whole thing was surprising. I just kept feeling like, oh, this is like the one I'm going to use like all the time. <laughs> Yeah, we get a lot of people who are kind of a little bit afraid of the blank canvas, I think. We made a conscious decision in designing the thing. I say we, I had nothing to do with it. I just talk about how great it is. But um, not to give people a sound to start with. You know, the, the blank canvas is there for a reason, to inspire people to uh, open up and create their own things. So I'm glad that you found that after a little uh, false start there. I love the blank canvas idea. Um, I too am a big fan of just like, use your brain. Come on, let's do it. It's, we're here to be creative. Let's have some fun. Um, I think, I think it was just a case of me, um, feeling like I didn't have time to improve a skill. Um, but now I have so much time. So I was able to come at it from a relaxed position and I had like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I suppose once you get busy, it's a little tough to find time for these things. And, and you've been busy for a long time. You've been working on a ton of exciting things with a ton of exciting people. Um, do you mind just maybe giving me a quick uh, potted history of your career? Is that possible in, in a minute or two? I, I can try. I might not remember anything. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, 2012, I put out a bunch of stuff self-released on SoundCloud. And then 2013, I did... Let's see. Let's just run through the labels from 2013 to 2014. I did... Huh. Okay. Play me Dim Mock. Did like an album on Dim Mock that I don't that I forgot about. And then uh let's see. Then I did stuff on Firepower. And then I did then I got signed to Never Say Die. And I've been on Never Say Die ever since, except for my 2014 album on Ausla, um, which is Skrillex's label. And then I did, let's see, I did a collab with him and then continuing on did a bunch of stuff with zomboy and eptic and abstract and then just continued on until about 2018 where i kind of like did a reboot of the whole project which really it's so fun like it wasn't really musically very different but i think i just like revitalized the project a little bit in 2018 and then from then on it feels like a like a new thing so 2018 on Must Die feels like very separate from the other one. So I've had two careers. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And do you have a new mission statement now? Are you aiming for something different? I am um, kind of. Yeah. I think there's a bit more of like a 
when I was growing up, I was very much like DIY, uh, like a hardcore punk metalcore kid. And I missed that. I got really involved in like the touring for a long time and playing shows and just kind of like, okay, you say where I go and I go and I do it. And then everyone is happy. Right. And then I realized that doesn't make me happy at all. And, um, I'm, I'm much happier when I feel like I'm actually doing something exciting for like kids who are like stuck at home in the Midwest and like think that what we do is cool. Like I want them to know that we actually like care and that, yeah, you can do it too. It's like, just don't do anything that you don't want to do and push, push, push and all that. So I think there's more of a focus on like, actually like a, more of a message. I think there's the DIY don't, don't be a big corporate dork. <laughs> is generally where my head has been at for the past few years is that, you know, the music industry needs a nice little tear down and rebuild. Absolutely. Never a truer word, man. Fantastic. Um, all these collaborators over the years, um, do you find that every different person that you work with brings a different challenge, a different energy, or is it all just working with people? I have never been much of a collaborator. I, there are a few people who I gel with, but I gel with them on a very personal level, like as close friends. It's really hard for me to submit to letting someone else work on my work. Um, I've gotten better about it in the past year. Um, but before that, it really was like, I, I work well with Zomboy. Um, I don't work well with Eptic historically, even though we're really close friends, but we're <laughs> just going to keep trying. Um, but Abstract, I think, is the, the artist I worked with where it literally just gelled. It was like, it felt like to me working on something, which was really great. That's really interesting. So what's the factor then? Because it isn't how much you get on with a person socially. It's, it's something about how compatible your workflows are or your, your attitudes to creation. Or I think someone just has to be as fast as me. Right. I know I, I think that's true it, it's always been that way I get really when I write it's hyper focus it's like I don't do like I'm gonna work on it for an hour and put it off for another day and it might I write a song in a day it's like I go in I have an idea I sit down if no one bothers me I sit there for six hours and it's done but if like now that I'm like busier it's you know two or three days to write a song but most people aren't that way and it's like a month Sure. And so whenever I would work with someone, they wouldn't have ideas faster than I would. So I would just finish the song. So maybe it's a stupid question, but how do you work so fast? How do you make songs so fast when everyone else is taking so long? I was born, I was born silly. <laughs> I don't know the answer. Um, I, it's been a, uh, it's just been that way forever. I'm, I've slowed down as I got older and, you know, like, don't stay up all night and actually like get proper sleep and <laughs> aren't like crazy and 20 anymore. But um, generally, yeah, I, it's just always been really fast. I don't know how I do it. It's, it's not, it wasn't sustainable for a really long time. It would leave me really mentally burnt out. And so now I've learned to like regulate it, but yeah, I, it used to be like I could write a whole song like in the car from the airport to the venue and then play it out that night. And I've done it multiple times and several EPs are literally just that. Wow. That's pretty impressive. It's... I don't know if it's impressive or if it's just like entirely reckless because there's no room for refinement when you're that fast. No, for sure. It's a different way of doing things, but uh, it sounds like a lot of fun. I kind of understand it wouldn't be totally sustainable though. There's a, a joy in the refinement as well, but how, how would you, do you have any, any tips, I suppose, for folks who would want to work just a little bit quicker? Yeah, I, I actually do. And I think that it benefits art to get what is from here to there as quickly as possible. And then maybe you want to come back and refine it. But I mean, I built, you know, the like block sketching, right? You're supposed to get the general idea, but I go one step further and I paint the painting first. <laughs> um, if you want to be faster, I'd say remove the block of, well, how is this going to, like, how is this going to come across? Chances are anything you make is going to work. And so the second you kind of get over it and 
don't think about, oh, well, it needs a second build up or blah, blah, blah. Like just literally go from start to finish. I work literally from the beginning to the end. So write an intro. Okay, cool. Do you want to bring in a melody? Okay, cool. Jot down the little melody that's in your head because I guarantee it's there. Okay, what do you want to do for the build? I don't know any of the five build types that exist in the world. There's like five. <laughs> <laughs> and like that kind of stuff, it's kind of just like removing thought and really trusting instinct because musical instinct when trained by listening to lots of music doesn't often fail you. Hmm. Do you think people worry too much about whether what they're making is good? Yeah, none of it's good. Everything is bad. <laughs> Let it all be bad. Yeah, I, yeah. I think people. I think people place too much importance on on uh, like good or bad. Ultimately, who are you trying to impress? I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I like. I certainly make music that I want to hear, and I think that that's not everyone has that goal in mind, right? And I think that's okay. But for me, I like to make things that I wish existed already, and then I'll be happy because it exists. That sounds like a great philosophy. And do you find that you more often than not achieve that? Or do you ever make stuff and then go, hey, I wouldn't listen to that? I rarely make something that I'm not happy with because I'm also very uh, into the idea of like, if you're not feeling it, don't do it. Like, I don't start a song and then go like, I got to finish this. Like, I am the kind of guy to just, like, leave really good songs that other people like that I don't like. Oh, just they're gone. Like, my management has been hounding me for years to finish this one song that's just, that's just not going to happen. But it could be a huge hit. But it won't be now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like that. Just accept that if you're not excited, it's not going to, then don't. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a really great attitude. Because... I suppose, ultimately, if you're not feeling the thing, you're going to hit a wall somewhere down the road, aren't you? Yeah, or you're going to feel a guilt with art. And if someone else really enjoys something you feel guilty about, that's not a good feeling. It leads to, like, bitterness in your own work, and that's not fair. No, sure. And you hear so much about that, people playing their one biggest song every night for the rest of their lives and wishing they didn't have to. I guess that's something you're avoiding. Cherry pie syndrome. Yeah, I am. Um, sure. Yeah, I, I try not to make anything that, like, I wouldn't want to be associated with. I mean, I've got stuff from my back catalog that, like, isn't my favorite, but I definitely liked it at the time. So it's kind of whatever. Yeah. Just, I think just a commu an honest communication with yourself as an artist is, like, my whole thing, I guess. That's a great thing. Absolutely. And um, do you find that as you evolve, you change and, and things in your rear view mirror do fade out of what you love or are you is it random do you still love some of the oldest things and some of the newest things what's the kind of the ratio i um i think i love some of the oldest things not musically so much as like i just remember the aha moment when i was making them and i remember being like man like little young lee was so happy about this song. I have this old song called Snow Cone and it's like this super chirpy, very anime intro sounding thing. And I just remember like writing it and being like, at the time I nailed the vibe. And now I'm like, that's so stupid, but I'm so happy about that song. And I like still sneak it in whenever I can in sets. Just, yeah, I love some of the old stuff, um, but it's more of memories. Like I remember the people that were around at the time and I'm very sentimental, but yeah, I'm, I'm always usually just like, I like what I'm doing right now. That's where my foot, that's where the serious brain is. And then the rest of it, I can fondly remember. Yeah, it sounds incredibly healthy. Why aren't you some sort of troubled genius? I don't understand. I used to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds wonderful. And um, that must set you up great for a, a future ahead of you. I assume you're not done yet. You've been in the business a while, but you're not retiring anytime soon. What, what is your future looking like? My future, uh, well, it's largely up to the powers that be right now. But in general, you know, barring any global pandemics, is generally going to be record, small tour, record, small tour, record, small tour, record, small tour. For the rest, I, I, I've decided through uh, the initial lockdown that I was basically done all year touring. I used to tour 
you know, 150 shows a year and I don't want to anymore. So I won't. So I'm going to write albums, which is the medium that I identify most strongly with. Um, Long form work is my favorite work. So I'm just going to do that. And then at the end of the year, just run out and do like big old mega tours. And then I'll come back and do it again for the rest of my life. Generally. That's, that's like what I want to do. I um, I have some other things I want to do. I'm interested in talking more with up and coming musicians about the things we kind of talked about. Philosophy is something I'm really interested in when it comes to music. I think it's a thing that's glossed over a lot. A lot of people love technical talk, but like all of it is to serve your creative brain. And I love talking about that. So I, I don't know. I'm talking to a couple of people to see if there are opportunities to like dig into that more. Cause I want to hear what other people think too. So I don't know, probably just like making albums, touring, and then talking about making albums and touring. Yeah, that sounds great. That really does. I mean, um, I hope you don't mind me now trying to um, impress you by saying I studied philosophy at university and I've got a ton of philosophical questions for you. If you great. want them. I, uh, for example, I always wonder with artists, musicians, other kinds of artists, do you think like romanticism with a capital R, things being beautiful is the aim? Are you trying to make stuff that people fall in love with, fall in love to, find pretty? You're shaking your head. <laughs> nope, I don't. I think I am making things that are statements from myself. I think that what I'm doing is essentially everything I make is a manifesto on like a specific thesis. Like if I make a song that's dubstep, I am talking about dubstep in that song and I'll probably be doing some kind of twist on the formula as like a, why couldn't we do this? This isn't boring. <laughs> like everything I do comes with a little bit of spite, like just a little bit of spite. And so, no, I, if I'm making something beautiful, chances are it's going to be cut heavily with something that's very surreal or like uncomfortable. Um, a lot of my favorite artists across the gamut, musically, visually, literature, really, really like the juxtaposition between uncomfortable and hard and beautiful. And so I do love beauty, but that is, that's not really my aim in a pure sense at all. If you, um, look at the other options then obviously ugliness and and aggressiveness um weirdness uh is there something that you're more intrigued by than any other yeah i like i like urgency and um like a brashness without being obnoxious i like i like that all my favorite art feels very like just begs you to look at it just like <laughs> Like a great example, something I just rewatched all of is the, the Neon Genesis Evangelion movies all are on, they're all streaming finally for the first time. And I watched all of those and the entire time this, these films are just like, look at me, look at me, look at me, nothing is okay. Look at me, look at me. And I'm like, oh, that's like really like urgent, immediate, important, quick art that's just like begging you to engage with it. I love that. And so when I, when I do things, typically my focus is not on I want to make these people fall in love with my music or, you know, I want people to find themselves in my music. It's literally very self-serving. Like I want you to pay attention to me kind of art. And that comes from like a very childish place, but it's, you know, it cut with a little bit of spite. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of um, people who think that art should be like genteel, that it should be well-behaved and it should know its place. And uh, you know, the punk philosophy, there's, uh, you know, the, a lot of the stuff you're saying it, sounds to me as if you think kind of exactly the opposite it should be shouting and it should be declaring yeah I, I mean yeah there's a place for calm you know ready to find a you know pick it up and appreciate it and put it back down art like i also love a lot of genres that really thrive in that zone but for for myself as a creator i've always liked art that kind of like you pass it and then it follows you down the aisle, right? Like that's what I like is just that sort of thing. And, you know, it doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't interface with everyone. Not everyone has that kind of um, interest in that kind of art. A lot of people enjoy music very passively. 
Um, but I find that my fan base tends to be the kinds of people who really, really obsess over music and really get into not just the music itself, but the ethos and the, the world kind of built around it. So I have a lot of fun playing with that too, kind of like the force field around the art, like the little bubble that it exists in and kind of curating that too. And, and I think that's like, those are the kind of people that I'm creating for aside from myself, but I am one of those kinds of people. So it's kind of like, if you're similar to me, then you'll like what I do. But if you are someone who enjoys art very passively, there might be something for you depending on the song. Like I use a lot of like big, simple melodies. And so those catch, but in general, my aim is to, is to pull people into the bubble. And part of that bubble is people looking at you and your own legend as an artist. How do you feel about fame? How do you feel about uh, being appreciated? Being appreciated is wonderful. And I think everyone in the world wants to feel appreciated for the things that they contribute as a, as a rule to the general planet. <laughs> like I'm, you know, that music is what I do. I don't do anything else. It's I, I make music and being appreciated on that level is fantastic. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't complain about it ever. Fame on the other hand is really arbitrary and it's kind of pointless and it doesn't really serve anything except for to make other people money. So it's like, <laughs> as long as my music is being appreciated by people that appreciate it, whatever fame may come is like, just the business it doesn't really feel like the art like mm. so i'm i'm in it for appreciation i want anyone who hears my music to appreciate it but i don't think that everyone in the world needs to know my name or come to my shows because like it's not for everybody and like that that hunger for for like base level appreciation is what leads a lot of people down like a really unhappy path so that's my views on fame, but I, I'm happy with what I have. I like, I really do appreciate the things that I have. If it's not a probing or unpleasant question, how famous are you? I'm in your own view. <laughs> I'm niche famous. I'm more famous than I think I am. And at, I think that surprises me. Like sometimes I'll, <laughs> here's a good one. Um, so I have a kid, I have a little boy and he likes the Wiggles and I like the Wiggles. They're great. And uh, we were watching the Wiggles and I had a video of him pretending to be the blue Wiggle, uh, Anthony. And so I messaged him on Instagram or on Twitter somewhere, a video, that video. And I just sent it over and I was like, check this out. And then now we are friends. And that, <laughs> that to me is the stuff that surprises me. And this happens with lots and lots of other famous people where like, I'm more famous than I thought I was, but I'm also not like a celebrity. So it's nice. Like I get the best of both worlds. Yeah, a certain degree of name recognition has its benefits, I guess. Yeah, I think being around as long as I have um, and being as involved as long as I have in like trying to innovate means that people may not always be fans of mine, but they've all like, if you're a dubstep fan, you've heard of me. Mm -hmm. And so that helps a lot because you may not, if you meet someone, they may not know who you are or like can name any of your songs, but like they know who you are. So it's like, you already have a leg up in, in connecting with them or like, you know, letting them into the bubble. So it's cool. I don't know. It, it, I, I, at one point in my career, I wanted more. And then I, over time, realized I really don't. <laughs> so healthy still. Um, you talked about innovation. Um, just maybe one last question then. Um, do you find it easier to innovate in sound design or in music uh, composition or, or um, some other area I think both I think I think there are people that innovate miles ahead of me in sound design because that's the thing that gives them joy 
and pleasure and all of that. And, and for a time in the beginning of my career, that also was true for me. But I have really fallen in love with um, not just songwriting as like a building blocks kind of thing, but songwriting as like uh, kind of meta, like it's so hard to explain, like deconstructing song types and being like, what is a house song? How can we flip that around and make it so that it's a functional house song, but it's like completely wacko. That kind of stuff I love and songwriting like in a melodic sense as well is something that I love, but I tend to keep everything pretty tame in terms of, you know, melodic structure because that's what I like. I like pop music. So I'd say the innovation comes from a mixture of all three where it's like half wacko sound design, half wacko structure, half wacko melodies. <laughs> and then it combines to be one wacko and a half. Yeah, well, I was really psyched listening to the newest album uh, to hear how accessible it was. It was still pretty wacko, but it's got a lot of very um, recognizable elements as well. Some some melodic and structural elements where you go, yeah, I know where I am and I like it. And it sounds like that's very intentional. It, yeah, it was. My idea was to basically take an EDM album and then run it through like a leave it in the dust after the apocalypse for 20 years and then dig it back up and like see how much of it is corrupted mm. was the idea of uh, the album it was basically, I would, I would write a dubstep song, a house song, drum and bass, here's some hard house, here's some trance, so-and-so. And then I would essentially take a Brillo pad to it and mess it up and then kind of leave it as if it was just like a little broken. <laughs> But yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you picked up on that. I, um, I really did do that intentionally. Yeah, well, it's a ton of fun. Um, will people find some of the same ideology in your content bank when they bust it open? Yeah, so the, uh, the content bank is definitely a continuation of that theme. There's a lot. I focused a lot on like leads and other elements that I think would serve people to kind of get them writing more melodically. And, you know, kind of giving people tools. I know, I know everyone can, bases are not hard to find, um, especially now, but like it, it can be really hard to find other things. So I tried really hard to make sure there was like an even balance, but um, yeah, I mean, a lot of the sounds are definitely things that I would have used on the album or, or things that like I did use on the album and recreated basically. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to wrap it up there and say anyone who's interested can go and find that new content bank on killerhearts.com right now uh, by Must Die. Lee, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you. This was a pleasure. It's been a joy. Yeah, we'll speak to you again soon, I hope. I hope so too. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. See ya.